We're going to be talking about uh, quality code here. And this is typically uh, a, a sort of a subject matter that people are like, ah, quality code. I want to know about like scalability and like raw iron and distribution and really cool stuff. So this is, this is going to be like boring stuff, talking about style and craftsmanship. You know what? That's nonsense. Code quality is the center of programming. Actually, you can bring the lights up here for, for me. That would be great. I, I changed my mind. This is for Brian. This is Brian's idea. I want mine. Thank you. Um, so I've been really interested in this topic uh, recently. And I don't know whether it's because I'm getting, getting older or, I don't know, maybe I'm bored. But I'm looking for, you know, uh, this idea of what you write as a programmer, to me, is starting to become the most important thing I can think of. I am really passionate about this topic. Um, computer scientists, we're computer scientists, we're programmers, data scientists. We're trying to think of ourselves as, as sort of machine oriented. So we write code for machines. Um, we write uh, software to make them do things, uh, manage memory, uh, dis you know, distribute load, uh, communicate from one node to another. That's pr primarily our job. So we have a, a business problem, and our job is to go marshal the, com the computer machinery and, 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 and have it do, its, do our bidding for us. I actually think that's wrong. I think that, that software is primarily a, a social thing. It's a human thing. Programming, the things that we do as programmers, have almost nothing to do with computers, really. We're, we're way past the stage where we're worried about memory, uh, maybe in some edge cases. Or um, what are we all, all concerned about? Concurrency. A language like Erlang sort of takes concurrency and, and it makes it very, very simple. So we don't have to, con we don't have to worry about that. Uh, what we're interested in is the social dynamic. So we write software for other people, users, uh, managers. Some, so there's some human on the other end of the chain where we're writing software. We also collaborate with other programmers. That's social. So we get together and say, okay, here's a problem, and we try to figure it out. We get into a room, we whiteboard things. That's social. But what I'm going to talk about today is actually a little bit different. It's social kind of in an internal sense. And I'll, 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 I'll tell you a story here. So software is social without any other person but yourself. And here's the story. So a couple years ago, I got up, had my coffee, uh, was very excited to do some programming, and I had to make a change on a particular piece of functionality for, for work. So this is day job stuff. And uh, I was greeted with this. So this was the code that I had to deal with. This is my good morning. And I don't know, again, if it's because I'm old or just I'm a misanthrope, there's something wrong with me, but I see this kind of code, and I become angry. I actually, like, my blood pressure goes up, and I have, like, an emotional problem with it. I, I seriously do. Um, how many people have looked at code in their life that's made them angry? Yeah. It's, it's, I'm not the only one. I'm not alone in that, which is comforting. But, 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 even, if, but, but even if I was, I'm okay with that. I, I understand I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit sensitive to certain things. And I'm very sensitive to this. And I thought to myself, the person who wrote this code is rude. <laughs> the person who wrote this code assumed that I had a lot of time on my hands. Right? Assumed that I was in a good mood. Assumed that I was chipper. I wasn't chipper. I wasn't in a good mood, and I, sh I sh surely didn't want to look at that. Of course, I wrote that code. <laughs> right. So I was angry with myself, and there was a turning point, and it was this block of code, literally. This, this is live production code. It's since been refactored, but this is live code. This is not a doctored example. So this is an actual, this has actually happened. And I said, you know, there's really, you know, I, I looked at this stuff, and I spent some time, at, time on it. And I finally sort of figured out what was going on. And a light bulb went on in my head and it said, the light bulb was this. There's stuff happening here that, if spelled a certain way, makes this wall of code easy to understand. I can rewrite this code in a way that is respectful, not rude, not presumptuous, presuming that I have infinite amounts of time to figure out what I wrote two years ago. I don't. Right? This is antisocial code. It's rude code. When we're having a conversation right now, we're using, at least I'm trying to use right now, clear, cogent, precise words. And typically, when we communicate as humans, we, t we talk that way. We don't go, blah, blah, blah. blah. It's like, what? Why did he just do that? That's rude. That's very antisocial. But that's what the... Oh. That's exactly what this code is doing. 
<laughs> I'm going to harness this stuff. This is going to be tricky. It's going to keep me moving along here. Um, yeah, this is exactly what this code is doing. It isn't being clear at all. It's saying nonsense. I mean, there's, it, it's, there's reason here, but it, it's unnecessarily verbose. Um, there, there's, there's logic embedded in this. So I'm using words right here. Logic, clear head. And you're thinking, okay, yeah, I'm with this guy. But this code doesn't, doesn't comply with that. And you'd be like, this guy is. Look at this thing. All right, now I hoped to evoke an emotional reaction for you, one that was negative and emotional. And I want you now to power through that. I want you to take a look at this. I'm going to walk through it. And we're just going to take a moment to figure out exactly what it is this thing does. All right. Okay, calm down. Take it one step at a time. We have here a log. Let's skip that. That's easy. We have here a collection of sort of variable, sort of a variable collection state. So name equals, user equals, password equals, option equals. So you can kind of see, okay, we're gathering some information in, in this section here, right? And then down here, we're saying use this stuff, name, user, password, options, to create a database, right? And then we're handling a couple cases. This is a case expression. So these are pattern matches. And we say this is good, so it succeeded. And this is bad, it failed. So in the, at the end of the day, this actually isn't that complicated. We're grabbing some arguments here, we're creating a database, and we're handling the result. <laughs> now, it took me a while to figure out what was going on, and it would take you a while to figure out what's going on. Now, once we figure out what's going on, we should be social. We should be respectful, empathetic, and that's what we're going to do. I've rewritten this function to its bare essence in this one simple line. What we're really doing, if we go back, it was, it was we're taking an AMQP message. So AMQP is a message protocol. And we say, this is a name. Just kind of roll with this. It's DB create, And we're handling a DB create function. That's what I want to do here. It's not the implementation right away. It's a dispatch. So we're taking DB create, And we're, we're passing it along to a function called handle DB create message. And we're done. We're done. Let's go back. Right. There it is. We're done. Thank you very much. <laughs> so we're actually not done yet. Uh, the interesting part is what? The handle the DB, the handle DB create. And this is the drama. This is important. This is cool. What was antisocial in this particular case right, is social in this case. Let's just take a moment to look at this. What did we see in the previous sort of breakdown of this thing? Right? So this is, this is the code we just copied and pasted in. This is the same exact code. We have a log here. We're collecting some arguments. We're using the arguments to create a database. And we're handling the result here. This is exactly what I just said, but it's in Erlang. And this code does exactly what it did before. It logs. There we go. Great. We, we get the DB create arguments. There it is. Drama. We call DB create with the arguments and we handle the result. Uh huh? Yeah, we are done. We are actually done. This is actually the implementation that we just saw. But it's after I sort of spent the time and energy to try to figure out what was going on, and then I spelled it out. This is social code. This is respectful code. If I had woken up in the morning to see this, I would have been happy with myself instead of self loathing. All right, so we're done. We're actually not done. Let's take a look at each one of these things. And what I'm going to do is walk through all of that code, which was kind of like a wall of code. And I'm going to just pound it. I'm going to ask the question, what is going on here? What is this? I'm going to get to an understanding of every single component, every single step along the way. I'm going to spell it out in the same way that I just spelled out the main implementation. And we'll see what happens. Ready? Does it sound like fun? Yes, of course it sounds like fun. This is great. This is the, this is, so. It's work. But I will assert that as programmers, this is what we do. We parse stuff into clear 
logic, clear statements. This is what I am doing. So we're going to ask the question, what's going on here, and we're going to answer that. Okay, so this is the, the collection of the arguments, and naively I'm going to use a record here to pass those around. And in Erlang, you could pass arguments around as lists, as tuples. And in this case, I'm being a little bit descriptive, and I'm going to create a record called dbcreate. I'm not going to get into what all that means. It's just a way to, put, to move values back and forth. So this is the same code I'm copying and pasting. Right? Collecting the name, user, password, options, and then I'm returning this. Now this is clearer, it's better, but I think it could be more social, it could be more respectful and more empathetic. Let's take a look at that. So this is the same code, the same logic, I'm creating a record here, but at each assignment, name, user, password, options, I'm delegating out to a specific function that's going to help me out. So I'm decomposing at a functional level. I'm taking kind of a wall of code that's going to take me time to parse, and I'm re-implementing it in a form that is easier to parse, and furthermore, making it slightly better. Maybe controversial. Yep. Why do you say naively creating a record? Mm. The, we, the reason I use the word naive here is I'm just simply copying and pasting the code in. So it means like first pass. Yep. So this is with presumably wisdom. Okay, so that's, that, that's it. That's, that's it. Right? We're done with, we're done with that. So notice at each stage, we're spelling out a solution in its totality. We don't have a, this sort of you know, sprawling of logic here. It's tight and it's focused. And we can black box the rest of this stuff. I, you know, I don't even care. If I'm not interested in what this is, I don't care. I just can look at this. This is what the dbcreateargs is doing. It's tight and focused, and I can look at this with my cup of coffee in the morning and not feel angry. This is like, thank you, Garrett. That was very kind of you to do this. I understand what's going on at a glance. So each one of these things, again, is just a copy and paste of the other code. So the db create name arg, right? We take our MQP message, we get a required attribute, and we do a verify db name on it. So this is kind of looking like business logic. Tight, focused, almost schematic, almost like you're you know setting up a, a, a MySQL server or a, a you know relational a relational schema. But it's a functional specification here. It's functional, these are calls to, to functions. But it's very literate. It's very social. So we do the same thing with user, with password, with options. Does that make sense so far? Do you f f get the, the, the vibe here? We're going from crazy to not crazy. That's really important. It really is important. I'll show you at the end, I'll, I'll show you throughout why this is not just important. It really is what we should be doing as programmers. OK, so I want to take a look at this thing. This is dbcreateOptions arg, and I have a case expression in here. So let me make a comment about a case expression. How many people here are Erlang programmers You do it sort of on a regular basis? OK, a lot. Great. Excellent. So I will say this. I use very, very few case expressions in my programming these days. Uh, a case expression, uh, and this, that's what this is doing here. It's evaluating. The, it's it's going to get a value here, and it's going to pattern match. And the result of the expression is one of these two. Right. So if it's undefined, it's an empty list. If it's closer, I, I look at this and I say, you know, there's actually logic here that's not clearly reflected. I can do this instead. So I can say, let's go back to this. So I can say, what is going on here? DB create, this is a function of something is, you're pulling a cluster attribute off of this message and returning some options here. So this is options, and it's basically just, just a function of cluster. So let's spell it that way. Here, db create options are, is just a function of the cluster option. So you can see this and know that I made a decision there. This, you have to infer it. So I'm taking time to be very clear and, and specific about what I'm doing. Cluster option, get attribute cluster. And here's, here's the point. Functions are named case expressions. So if you used case expressions, you like them, consider turning them into functions. Every case expression that you use can be converted into a function. That function is going to have a name and a precise set of arguments. Try it and see, see, see what happens. You will, you will spot something very interesting. It forces you to understand what that case expression is doing. It's the same exercise that we're going through now. That's a side point. Matter of style. Okay, so a named case expression here. Cluster option. So this is that case expression. So, so we're handling by name here. Cluster option. Undefined is empty. Cluster. Set of options, same thing. 
Right? So it's more of the same type of process. Okay. So let me stop for a second. So what we've done right now is we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to, how to deal with options. And we're going to go into the simple process here of creating a database and handling the DB create. So this is the main storyline. So that code tells us what we're doing. I'm going to spell out the rest, but let me just stop. Any questions or comments? No? How many people use this style in their, in their, in their uh, programming? Really? Do you? Be honest. Okay. All right. So this isn't, this isn't controversial, right? But it is very rare, I found, in practice, and even in my code. It's difficult. And this is why I think it's important, because it forces you to spell out precisely what it is you're doing in code. And here's why it's important. I'll reiterate this. It's not just you, Saturday morning with a cup of coffee. It's your colleagues. If you're an open source project, it's the community who reads your code and tries to figure out what on earth you're doing. When you come back to that code, uh, trying to uh, uh, figure out how to change it, like how to modify it. When you see a wall of code and you're not really sure what it does, it's difficult to know what to change and how to change it. But if you have well-defined, precise mappings of all of your thoughts, you're responsible and, and, and humane in the way you're communicating, you can approach that code in a very reasonable way and say, here's how this type of change would affect this code. Do you buy that? Is it controversial? Good. Yeah? All right. I've got one fan. Great. I've converted one person. <laughs> I'm excited about that. Well, that's a starting point. Okay. Hopefully we'll convert too. Okay. So let's take a look at the create DB. So this is our original code here, right? This is a case, and we're basically saying, ah, I'm going to go create database and then handle the results. So this is really very, the, the create is actually just a call to an external library. So it's not real fancy. We're just going to pass it through to the external function. So here's our DB create. We're using our record here, pulling off the arguments, and then we're just passing them through here. This is sort of like a translation of an internal mode, like internal to the module, to, to something else. It's like a, a translator, uh, some sort of protocol translation. So I want to reflect my arguments in one way. This guy consumes them as a list to this function call. That's all, that's all it's doing. Very simple. Okay, so what about the rest of this thing? So if we go back to our case expression, we have these two cases. Okay is good, error is bad. Boom. There we go. This is our handle db create. We're going to, in this case, if we get a good result, yep, that's happy. So we're going to do this thing. Da, 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 da. This, I'm, so I'm starting to hear shouting going on. I'm starting to hear rude behavior here. This feels rude to me because I don't know what's going on. This is like what? Adders, slaves, what host info doesn't make any sense to me. I just hope it works. It's, I'll test it a lot. I really don't understand what this is. I'm going to change this, but this is an example of code that w when I see that, that's sort of a smell to me. It's that this is you know, only two lines, but it can be made clear. There's something going on here that needs to be spelled out. So we'll see what that looks like. And here's the error case. We're just going to log, and we're, and we're going to pass the error back as, as this format here. Okay? So that's our handler. So we created the database, and here is the logic that we're using to handle it. Simple. So let's, let's deal with this stuff here, this bit of nonsense. Oh, yeah. OK, so, so this is how we deal with it. We handle DB create. What's going on here? What we're doing is we're basically translating this internal structure to a, to a function call. This is something good. So we, it was created. The database was created here. So we're going to call this handle db created. Right. So we're not going to, again, we're not doing too much here. We're just going to pass this through to something else. But we're spelling out the logic in a very, very simple way. When I look at this code, it's like, what do you, what's there to figure out? I mean, really, yeah, there's some curly braces. And if you're not used to the syntax, maybe, but that'll take you all of 10 minutes to figure out. The rest of it is semantics. It's what's going on. Handle db create, OK. Handle db created, good. There's no controversy there. There's no rudeness. It's, it's quiet. It's, it's, it's zen-like. It's like, OK, I'm not stressing because of this. And notice that every stage, every little block along the way is zen in that respect. It's quiet. Right? But when you orchestrate the whole thing, it becomes very powerful. But at any point that you look at it, it's very quiet and understandable. No stress. This is what it does. And then, of course, the db create error here is handle db create error. Simple. Make sense? This should make a lot of sense. I think it's clear. 
personally. So this is a success case, and this is an interesting point here. And so this has actually happened in real life. I looked at this thing, and it goes, I have no idea what I'm doing here. I just I wrote this code, and I'm, lo I'm looking at it, and I'm like, Garrett, what were you thinking? What did this mean? And I had to channel somehow myself. Of course, I didn't write a comment. I didn't document it. It's just this code here. So I, I literally have no idea what this actually means. So I had to do some research. Have you ever had to do research about code that you didn't know what it meant? Anyone? I don't know what this means, and so you did research. So you asked somebody, or you searched through 15 different classes or modules to figure out what something does. It was kind of like that. So I'm like, at some point, I figured out that this is a legacy. There's some legacy backward compatibility thing going on here. So this is here only for the sake of backward compatibility, so something doesn't error out because it expects this thing to be empty. OK, fine. Let's do that and make it clear. All right, so this is, this is my one step to get to a, a proper response. So DB created response, and let's take a look at this. Just take a look at that for a second while I get some water. See what I did here? I took that bizarre thing, right, that bizarre slaves empty string thing, and I gave it a name. You can do that with a function. It's easy. I just gave it a name, apply db created legacy attributes. Maybe not the best name, but at least gives me some clue as to what I was doing here. And you can document that function, right? You can focus in, the function has a well-defined interface, that it's got a name, it's got a set of arguments. So I'm you know, putting this in, I'm getting this out. And we'll take a look at that in a second. But this is a way of being, in my opinion, respectful. Rather than just leaving code, blah, 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 blah. Like, well, I don't know what that means. Here, function says apply db created legacy attributes gives me a sense of what's going on. So I take the normal result here, I apply the legacy attributes, and then I, re I re return my message response this way. So this is the success response, all spelled out clearly, calmly, succinctly, socially. All right. So apply db create a legacy attributes, also known as functions are good for naming decisions. And that's the whole point of this exercise. Erlang is very, very good at allowing you to name your decisions, your logic, your programming exercise in functions. And that's all you need. And you can build amazingly beautiful, powerful, maintainable, testable code using this methodology. What's the methodology? Don't stop until it's obvious. Keep working until your code is completely obvious. And when it's obvious to you, chances are it will be obvious to you later. If it's obvious to you, chances are it will be obvious to someone else. It's got a good chance, at least. As opposed to I'm just test, 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 test. You leave behind working tests. Congratulations. When it comes time to understand what's going on, though, where are you at? Are you documenting things? Do you have comments peppered through your code? If you do, that's fine. Take all of that thinking and translate them into well-defined constructs in your working code. So in Erlang, you can do that with functions. OK, so here's that function. We're taking our slaves, we're wrapping it up, legacy attributes. That make sense? It's an easy way to do it. When this goes away, you can delete the function. It's cool stuff. Okay. And here's the error case. I'm just going to respell that. So we have log, we have this bit of you know, stuff, that, 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 all this stuff here. This is a bug, by the way. I found a bug. I found this bug. I won't get into it. But there was a bug in the code, and I found it because I had reduced this, this particular function, and I could see the bug right there. There's two lines of code. I'm like, what is that? And that wall of code, you're just like, yeah, the test pass. I'm happy. I'm going to go home. I'm going to go drink beer. The test pass. But in the light of day, bugs and faulty reasoning and bad antisocial bad code comes out. And you can then work to be a nice, responsible social coder for yourself at the very least. OK, so let's, let's recap here. So this is the original function. Remember it? It doesn't look so bad now because we don't have it anymore. We got rid of it. We don't have to fear this. We don't have to wonder what's going on. This is a really very simple function. Here's the, here's the translated stuff. This is, the, this is the, the new version. I know what some of you are thinking. We went from this. You're like, you know what, that doesn't look so bad, actually, <laughs> if this is the, the thing that you think is good. I know that you're thinking that. I know that you are. It's okay. All right. So I will concede that. 
I will concede that this approach results in a lot more functions. Because that's the point. We're taking you know, these problems and we're reflecting them as functions. So you'd expect there to be more functions, right? That's fair. You get more lines of code. You get t more total lines of code. You'd be surprised that it isn't that much more, but you definitely get more. So I concede that. You're right. But here's the difference. You have much, much shorter functions. This demands short functions. This will result in short functions. It will drive your functions down really to almost to the shortest possible variety. And what's the point of that? What's the, what's the advantage of that? So, that's my next one here. Yeah. So the advantage of that is when you have something that's very, very small, you're not saying very much at any point in time. You're never taking a, any kind of big jump. It's very, very iterative and incremental. And when you have very iter iterative and incremental code, it helps your brain because we're basically very simple people. We're simple creatures. And this is a social experiment. This is a social process. When we write software, we're doing it for other human beings and we're doing it for ourselves. And we get, a, we get, a, 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 get ahead of ourselves by programming for the machine. So our code is simply getting the work done but it doesn't reflect the work that we actually put into it. This process reflects the work that you put into it. It leaves it behind in a respectful manner for yourself and for others. Okay, so this is clear, respectful, empathetic human code. Touchy-feely. Uh, that does make me feel uncomfortable. I mean, it does. I mean, because I'm a science, you know, engineer. I don't care about this stuff, right? Except for the fact that when it comes to changing stuff, modifying stuff, count the number of hours you spent chasing down antisocial code. Just do it. Just count it. Keep track of it. And consider how much time you would save if somebody had put this sort of energy into, into writing software. All right. So the advantage of this stuff, I'm going to skip through this. Where are we at here? Oh, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to, we're a little behind, so I'm going to like cut into my talk so everyone else can have a full, full time. So this is the summary, though. This is a summary. Let me just run through this. Ad nauseum, you're like, I'm really tired of it. this handle AMQP message is so boring. All right, so this is the big picture. You know, people, people protest something. Okay, let me go back to this point, this thing here. Lots more functions. Here's what somebody says, and there's a certain level of anxiety that exists when you have lots and lots of things. It's like having a really cluttered room. Um, it's like, you know, you, you, you know, people like to sort of put their code in order. So you have modules and classes and hierarchies, and it's like, it's, it, it's like a, um, it's how we organize our life, sort of. We put things into boxes, and the, the thing is, that doesn't scale very well, and the universe doesn't act like that. There are, there are no categories out. I mean, we, we have these taxonomies of mammal and dog and, and feline, and, you know, they're just things that we make up to understand them. They don't actually exist in nature. What exists in nature are, are, are programs and matter, right? Things that, you know, obey the laws of physics. There aren't these categories. This whole lots of functions thing is kind of like that. You have all of these little pieces all over the place. So how do we organize things when we have all a bunch of stuff all over the place? How do we mentally organize that, keep track of stuff? Right. Do we use an object hierarchy? We class hierarchy and we manage things? No, we don't, actually. We focus selectively on what we're interested in. So hopefully you're focusing on me right now, and, and I'm focusing on you, and so we're, we're selectively focusing. And, you know, but Carl's over there vi recording a video. I've got a timer over here. There's all sorts of other things. And if we were to focus on that stuff, we would have a sort of a mental disorder. We, we, we'd be you know, disturbed. I mean, these exist. The ability to focus on something is, you, you know, is a sort of human trait that lets us tune out the stuff that we're not interested in. So if we go back to this, what's cool about this is if you're interested in the very high level thing, look up here. Right? If you're interested in the big, big picture, you look up here. And you don't, have to, you don't have to look at anything else. Remember when we said we were done? We were done. If you're interested in the big picture, this is where you want to look. And you can tune the rest of this stuff out. Forget about it. If, on the other hand, you're interested in the DB create stuff, you focus here. You don't care about the high level. Right? It's, what we do as, it's what we do normally. We focus selectively. We could focus on the universe. We could focus on atoms, something very big, something very small. We could focus on a human. We can focus on a building. Right? We don't have to categorize things. So the fact that we have lots of functions really, in theory, shouldn't be a big deal. And if you have emotional problems with that, 
it's okay. There are, there's therapy, you can do all sorts of things to, to, to deal with your anxieties about having lots of functions. I think practically speaking, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't. Yeah. Uh, can you go back to the slide with all the functions? Yeah. So here in that case, handle DB create. If it starts throw erasing exceptions in DB create, your pattern no longer works. Is that a sign that you broke down your control flow too much into functions and not enough into actual control flow? Because you're losing the semantic of a try catch could have, for example. Well, so I mean, I wouldn't concede that having functions is losing flow control. It is flow control. I mean. Really, what, what's your alternative? Our case expression. So, or, or you know, so. It's a case, or it's a try catch, or it's an if, or it's a. Yeah, I mean, there's it's still conditional logic, and in Erlang, these are all sort of the same thing. So the observation was that you know by breaking this down into a bunch of functions, do you lose sort of maybe visibility uh, into your flow control? And that to me seems to presume that you've lost flow control here. I think you've actually articulated your flow control very precisely. I mean, in DB create, you have to change that pattern. It no longer works. You have to put a try catch in there. There's no way to catch something with a function. Well, so you can. You can use catch. That's so, terrible. Uh, <laughs> it isn't terrible, actually. It's not terrible. Um, it, it's a different pattern. It, it, I mean, it, so we're, we're sort of sort of getting into the edge cases, and this will we will get into. We should talk about this tonight over beer because I think it'll be fun. Right. Um, so I think try catch actually presents problems in Erlang. I don't like try catch. Uh, for, for this very reason. I actually use catch. Um, I'll already use a function that actually wraps that logic so that, so that it, anyway, uh, re religious, maybe family discussions here that, you know, it's, it's okay. We're, we're still friends. It doesn't matter. Okay. Okay, so where are we at here? We, we, oh, really? Okay, okay. So let's wrap up here. I thought I was going to be early. Of course, I'm never early. Um, okay. So why do we care about this? I've, I've beaten this down. It's social. But here's, this, here's what's really, really cool. I did this as, as an experiment. This is in all honesty. This happened. This is like a story. So I did this, and I said, you know, I don't know if I'm going to like this or not. I don't know if this is actually going to work. So I've given this thing two years, and I've really committed to this. And there's no way I'm going back. I love this so much. It makes me a better programmer because I'm, 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 I'm just committed to spelling things out, which is so important. It is the process of programming. But here's a real payoff. When you come back to the code, you have this, this map, of this, this logical map of the decisions that you made, and you can navigate it just like a map. You can say, I need to make this change. What is this change? Oh, it affects this piece of code here logically. Right? Oh, therefore, it, it affects this function. Right? Remember that whole hierarchy? You can look at the universe. At the, right? It depends on where you want to look. A change will almost necessarily, right? it, it, if, if it's a well-defined change, it'll affect one function. It'll have one point in your map. It's a very, very refreshing way to look at your code. And you're like, wow, it just affects this. And you'll see that your, the, the diffs in your code history are very discrete with this kind of methodology. Similarly, it's possible to debug, right? I think it's very hard to debug things when you don't understand them. Ever try that? Very hard. It's very hard. It's very frustrating. It's very frustrating, seriously. I mean, like, so, like I don't want to do this anymore. Like, I don't like my job. I hate this. Because it's so hard to like get into code that you have no idea, you just don't know what's going on. It's terrible work. It's terrible. And, and my opinion is this is just a function of being, frankly, rude. And I, I put myself in the same thing. This is, you know, it, it's stuff that we can correct by taking the energy to, to, to write software this way. Of course, it's easier to test. And I, I found that I've, I'm testing less. I'm just less afraid. Like, I've spent so much time on this that, that, like, if I got one little thing wrong here, it'll pop up somewhere and I'll be able to fix it because it's all reasoned. So I actually test quite a bit less here because I'm less afraid. Okay, so I've, I've identified the, the main objection, which is there's too many functions. Give me an objection and I'll address it. Come on, bring it, bring it. What? Uh, your function names are a lot more specific than your variable names were. Okay. So I think you would have gotten the same or a similar boost in clarity if you just, you know, passed down case yeah. instead of snakes. So the observation is that the variable names were kind of terse. Um, that's deliberate. Um, I think when... Uh, um, I actually uh, have stolen this from Joe. Uh, Joe likes to name his variables. Um, and if you have a very short function and the context is limited, uh, the variable names could almost be X and Y. You know, it, it, so um, I find that when you go too much in variable name, it sort of be, I would much rather see a well-defined function. But this is, this is personal preference. I'll say this, that it should be obvious that's subjective. 
take if if you're interested in doing this, do it yourself. I mean, this is your, your you should have your own personal process here and figure out what works well for you and for for people you work with. Joe. When it came to Prolog, didn't have case statements, and I think you were, you were first to that. Um, two sort of, one is a objection, I think, and that is, it's difficult to invent names. Do you have trouble inventing all these Spend names? a tremendous amount of time on names. Right. It's extremely difficult. It's extraordinary. It, it, so take a case expression. You know, there are some cases where you know, I, I, I'll just use it because, it, frankly, there is no good name. It would be like, you know, executes case expression. You know, it's, 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 there's no value add there. But if, there's a, if there's, but if there's a value there, and there often is, there more often than not is, it forces you to think about that. What's going on there? Or that, that whole thing with the, uh, the cluster, right? Get cluster name. It took me a while to figure out what I was doing there. Yep. Case statements um, import the variables outside their scope. Yes, so not to introduce them as additional arguments. And is that telling you? I have a big you, objection. Would oh, you then oh, sort of make a closure? And is that telling you something that the arguments that are going into function are wrong? Does that yes, absolutely. So when you go, yeah. So the observation is that in case expression, you can use all of the free variables around the case expression, all the context, so the arguments of the function, and anything that you've defined in, in above the case expression that you have access to. When you convert from a case expression to a function, you lose all the free variables that don't, no longer apply. So it forces you to identify specifically what, what arguments are involved in that operation. That's the point. So you give it a name and you give it a list of arguments, and now you have a tightly defined interface to that logic, that decision that you're making. That's why it's valuable. The process of doing that is programming. We do that. That's, that's our job. So if you're not doing that, you're not programming. You're just like... Ah, you know, that thing. <laughs> Don't do that. Yeah. Lloyd. I have a big objection. Okay. Good. This doesn't look like 90% of the code I see in GitHub. <laughs> <laughs> it's extremely rare. It doesn't, I mean, oh. Yeah, no, it's rare. Come on. Come up. Yeah. No, this is, this, this type of thing is, you know what's cool about this though is it's very easy to spot. That's like bad, I can tell you right now. I don't have to review this. If somebody said, here's my code, here, I'm done. No, you're not. If somebody said, here's your code, I'd be like, oh, okay. I don't care. I mean, somebody's obviously thought through this quite carefully, and if it works, I'm fine. Right? So it doesn't look like this, and it's too bad. I think you know, we, could, we could take this upon ourselves to go out and like evangelize this whole thing. Yeah. Extending the free, bar free variable thing. You don't have any <coughs> in here for any of the You've got a couple places, mm -hmm. but most of the time when I want the free variables or a long list of them, it's because I want context for the log message. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So the observation is that you know you might want to use case expressions to make your logging more convenient. Um, I don't think I'm going to buy that. I think that the operation is if it if it's loggable, you can discreetly log it. Um, you also might find that tracing works okay, so I can punt on that. Uh, it's a bit of a, 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 a sort of a slippery out there. But um, yeah, I don't think so. I think, I think that if your logic is, you know, you can always have a, 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 log, statement, a log statement above it, right, that, that logs, you know, the, I'm going to call this operation with the following context. So I would never want to compromise a function for the sake of, of logging its context. That's the, sort of the job of the thing above it, in my, in my thinking. And it's certainly debatable. You take each thing and, and consider it, but I don't think I would certainly generalize that as a, as a rule for, for, say, using case expressions over functions. I, I wouldn't. Anything else? I think I have probably no time left. Fair? I'm done. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, by the way, we, you know, we're going to have an open Q&A at the panel discussion tonight, so we can bring up anything that was talked about today in great detail over beer or other beverages as, you're, as you choose. Who's next? Brian. Next up. Next up.
is the same matching of well, the it's, time for a it just happens at a different point. And I think it may be the same algorithm. I don't know what the sequence, but I think it's, yeah. So it's doing it's doing its optimized search ordering and so forth. On the function things. It's not having to enumerate down to the like putting it in the function. As I understand it, there are people here who would actually <laughs> I feel like I'm saying way too much here. So next speaker is from uh, California. Finally a non-Chicagoan. <laughs> um, Brad Trotwine is uh, an engineer at Adderall and he, uh, they have